Uh, welcome, everybody. You've just learned the first thing about doing business with the city of Evanston. Expect us to be a little late. But I do want to welcome you because this meeting is important to me as well as to all of you. Evanston should be a place where minorities, women, and Evanston-based uh, businesses can do business with large entities like the hospitals, the city, Northwestern University, Rotary, and I thank everyone for being here to help um, all of you understand how to do business with large bureaucracies. I do want everyone to know that we have proven in Evanston that minorities, women, Evanston-based uh, businesses do terrific work. The NSP2 Neighborhood Stabilization Program 2 uh, work that everyone did was absolutely superb. Those houses that, and condos, the apartments that were rehabbed, that had been foreclosed and were rehabbed and um, sold and rented as affordable housing, the workmanship that went into those was incredibly good. Uh, Senator Durbin, Congresswoman Schakowsky came with me and we toured uh, several times, both to see the finished product, but also uh, while the work was ongoing. And we're incredibly impressed with the talent that you all have. So I want all the uh, major employers, like the hospitals, Northwestern, to know that you are a very talented group of people and do incredibly, incredibly good work. And I would like to say nice things about Alderman Braithwaite, who has been very instrumental in, uh, in these meetings. I would like to point out that I jump-started his career in public service by appointing him as alderman. But uh, I'm very proud of the work you've done, particularly with this group. And Evanston should be a place where minorities, women, Evanston-based businesses uh, are thriving. And that's part of who we are. So thank you, Peter, for all the work you've done. And take it away, Peter. If you could all give a hand to the mayor again. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to uh, be here today and for all that you do to make Evanston a better place. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to try to like warm this room up just from this position. I'm seeing a lot of like flat faces and I'm really excited this morning not only to have you all here and thanking you very much for taking time away for your, from your businesses to be here this morning but also to thank very much our entity, and Marty's gonna later on introduce everyone. Thank you for being here, for taking time away from your schedule. Uh, this is a very important day for, for many of us, and on behalf of, of uh, the committee, the MWEBE committee, I just wanna greet you and thank you. And before I go further, I wanna quickly acknowledge those members of our committee that are here in the room, if you can just sort of wave your hand so people can see you. Very instrumental in, in putting this day together. As well, I really need to acknowledge our staff, uh, Mr. Marty Lyons, our assistant city manager, Mr. Joe McCray, our deputy city manager that helped us kick this off last, get this started last year, Lou Gerges, and uh, purchasing Miss Tammy, who I could not uh, say enough about in purchasing. Uh, is Sharon here as well? Okay, thank you very much. And Marty, I'm sure you'll continue to acknowledge staff throughout the day. Um, our goal is very simple. We wanna increase the local spend. We wanna help businesses find opportunities to access the city resources as well as with our other local partners that are here today. We believe that by helping to increase that local spend, that it's gonna help create job opportunities and of course recycle the dollars in our city. So I don't wanna take up any more time. I'm definitely looking forward to hear what our guests have to say. I hope that during the breaks that you bought plenty of business cards to network, 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 not only with the folks that we've invited but amongst the businesses that are here. So I look forward to interacting with you and thank you again. Mr. Lyons, are you up next?
Good morning, everybody. As uh, Alderman Braithwaite uh, noted, I'm uh, Marty Lyons. I'm the uh, Chief Financial Officer for the city, and as such, uh, uh, have oversight over purchasing, accounts payable. So the way for this group, that is um, getting the business and then getting paid for the business. So both sides of that equation. So if you ever have questions, concerns about that, please feel free. Uh, my information's on the website. Uh, you can get on uh, www.cityofevanston.org. Uh, I'm mlyons at cityofevanston.org. So if you ever have concerns about purchasing on the way in or accounts payable, trying to get that money out of the city in a timely fashion, uh, please feel free to give me a call um, if there are any um, snags. We have a lot, I'll mention some very talented staff that may get a response for you even quicker, so I'll always direct you to folks who are right on the front line when possible. So our format today is the same as we had last year, uh, where we are going to have um, our partners in the community, our large business um, entities, coming up and discussing how to do business with them. Uh, I will just have one uh, um, preamble for the city. How you'll do business with the city may change a little bit over the coming year. Uh, how many of you have gone through a software conversion? So we're going through a software conversion right now. So, you know, Yahoo. Um, so uh, you know, from that perspective, we're bringing in a, uh, what I would call a, a, a little bit more compact system that we hope is gonna do some new things for us. They're not gonna come off the, um, uh, the drawing board right away. So that's why I say some of our changes won't happen in the first quarter, but our goal is to continue to be an electronic organization to help you um, bill us electronically, to provide bid documents, quotations, et cetera, electronically, to really make it easy for you to do business with the city from your desk, not from our desk. So uh, with that being said, any time that you're seeing a process that we're using and say, you know, one of my other uh, businesses that I do business with does it this way, we're happy to take that input because we are in a conversion. And we also use our web design folks to make a lot of changes. We've been doing a lot of things on the receivable side, our receivables that have nothing to do with the brand new system. I've been using, I don't even know who WooFu is, but I use them um, to collect money uh, on the web. And it's, uh, it's, it's not expensive, it's nimble. So uh, we're looking at a lot of changes at the city and how we do business. And we're happy to take input from our business community on that same subject. So with that being said, Jonathan, do we have any, any issues? What's going on? You're, you're, you're making me worried. <laughs> All right, so uh, I am, uh, first I'd like to make sure that I introduce everyone. Uh, we have uh, Jim Conrad from Northwestern University, Scott Daniels. You guys were really co cooperative. Is that on the, so uh, uh, Bonnie Kent, right in my order here, this is, and, uh, and Kimberly Henry, so uh, from uh, both school districts. So they will be giving presentations uh, I'll let each speaker tell you whether they want questions during uh, presentation or not. We will certainly have time afterwards and make ourselves available for your questions. And uh, Tammy, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but let's make sure we talk a little bit about other things we're doing differently this year so that we get feedback. So we have some things that we've added to the program this year. So uh, without further ado, uh, Tammy, is it you? All right, we're going to, Tammy Turner is our purchasing manager, and since I uh, had Rotary mentioned, they've, uh, I've always been told it's good to um, give a good introduction for folks. So Tammy Turner is our new purchasing manager, but not new to purchasing. She's been with the city many, many years, has uh, stepped up this year in the manager role, and uh, from our internal departments who get POs from you and work with you directly. Uh, we've had nothing but positive feedback. So I hope that you will have a great relationship also with Tammy over this coming year. Please feel free to give feedback to Tammy's boss, Lou Gergitz, or to me, or straight to Tammy, but we're really trying to uh, um, turn around and shorten our turnaround times for all of the business we're doing with you. So Tammy, please take it away. Good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and thank you again um, 
to the presenters who have, are here with us this morning. Um, I thank you for the uh, second year for presenting and um, coming through the snow, rain, preparing for us. Um, greatly appreciate it. Um, and thank you to all of you. If this is your first year attending, um, welcome. This is our second annual procurement event, and we hope to do many more procurement events. And also, we're open to um, new ways of um, networking with you guys and open up opportunities here in the city and with our um, local entities as well. Again, Marty mentioned um, I'm the new purchasing manager here at the city of Evanston, and we have been planning this event for some time with the MWEBE committee, and I thank them for their support and for being here this morning as well. <clears throat> Okay, first screen, um, this is how you can contact the purchasing office. Um, the purchasing office actually is located here on this floor down the hall, so you should be familiar with where we're located. We're in room 4200, um, and if you walk in, we're open to receiving visitors. Um, you can also contact us through the purchasing email address, which is purchasing at cityofevanston.org. You can call us directly at 847-866-2935, or you can utilize the city's new 311 call center. Not only can you reach purchasing, but you can reach all city departments. You can um, have questions answers, or if you need service requests, the 311 center, call center can help you. If you're within Evanston city limits, it's 311, but if you're outside of Evanston limits, it's 847-448-4311. So um, during our pre presentation here for the city of Evanston, we're going to talk about the following processes for procurement. Um, so we have, <coughs> excuse my voice also please. So our main ways that we procure services and goods for the city is through invitation to bid, which is ITB and there's a selection and requirement process, a request for proposals, which are the RFPs, and we will also give you some information about DemandStar. It's an internet um, site that we use to upload our bid documents that you can access, and you also can access the city bids and RFPs through the City of Evanston website. We're also going to cover the city ordinances, the legislation for MWEBE and our local preference. And we're also going to go through um, why we have the MWEBE and LEP, LEP program. So before I go any further, let me just let you know that the city of Evanston fo um, follows the Illinois state statute, which is 65 Illinois ILCS 58 dash nine dash one <clears throat> in addition to the city of Evanston city code which is title one chapter 17 section section one <clears throat> our Im invitation to bids <clears throat> cover five major sections of the bid document they include the instructions to bidders the terms and conditions, the technical specifications, and the MWEBE specifications in the bid proposal. Now some of the items that you might find in the instruction to bidders are the submission requirements, where and when to turn in your bid documents, how you should prepare the bid documents, and information about the MWEBE goal and compliance and the laws that we are governed by. In the general conditions, you will find items such as the contract term, the payment information, um, the prevailing wage information, and information that's required for bonds and insurance purposes for the City of Evanston. 
The technical specifications is going to give you the meat of the document and what we're looking for, what we're um, attempting to purchase and for goods and services. Okay. And then the next slide, you will see <clears throat> some additional requirements for our invitation to um, bids. The bid forms are usually our exhibits A through F. There might be additional exhibit forms depending on what type of bid um, document that is for or a type of purchase. And some of the usual forms that you will see that you should be familiar with when you're doing business with the city of Evanston are the bid form which includes the, your company information, the signatures, who have, those who have authority to sign for your company, also, that's where you're going to put your reference information and your total bid price. We also utilize the conflict of interest form. You're also going to see our disclosure of ownership forms. And again, there's multiple exhibits that are required in the bid document that you should become familiar with. Also, the City of Evanston performance and um, bid bonds. We do require, with our contracts, a bid bond in the amount of 5% of your contract, the total bid of your contract. And performance bonds are required as well. And the performance bond is 110% of your bid. So the, mater um, the performance bond, and the reason we require a performance bond, it's issued from your surety company, and it stipulates a legal written obligation to guarantee that payment will be made for any uh, financial loss that might be caused by default or from the contractor from yourself. So we do require a performance bond as well. And I'm not going to go over too much of the MWEBE forms. Um, Sharon Johnson, our compliance officer, will give you more detailed information about those forms and the process. Now our bids. Normally, they're for unit pricing. It involves a um, detailed amount for, um, I'm sorry, a, um, an amount for the equipment, materials, and labor. Examples of uh, a bid required um, document, or when we go out to bid, would be for a one mile, <clears throat> a one mile repavement of Dodge Avenue. And bids are awarded to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder. Our next formal solicitation, solicitation that we use is the RFP. And the request for proposal is an opportunity for you to submit your qualifications. We'll give you a, a detailed scope of what we're looking for or the type of service we're trying to purchase. And you're going to tell us what. <clears throat> why we should select your company. So it's more than just the price. We're looking for your um, suggestions on how you're going to um, do this, what you're going to accomplish, and how you're going to accomplish it. So again, when we ask for RFP, it's not based solely on price. Also, <clears throat> for the request for proposal, Again, it's a competitive process for services or projects in which unit pricing is not the only defining factor. And it can also be used for more than one method that may provide the desired solution that the departments are looking for. Also, with the RFP process, there is an evaluation criteria that we do follow. What we look for is experience and qualifications of the proposer and your staff that you're going to say is going to work on this project. Your project management approach and the recommended solutions to what we're giving you to work on. And your financial capabilities and pricing. The method of award is to is um, accomplished by the highest ranked responsive responsible proposer again. And the next slide, regarding the request for a proposal, there are six major sections of the proposal as well as similar to the bid document. 
and the proposal asks for an over, um, gives an overview in, of the proposal and the procedures. It gives a scope of service. It also gives a propo um, the proposal format and submission requirements that are required as well. It also lists the evaluation and selection process. And it's also going to um, list the form of a agreement that we're looking for. And again, there's attachments, there's um, forms that are required that are to be returned with your proposed document. Now, before we go any further with DemandStar, let me tell you a little bit about our deadlines and requirements. We usually um, advertise on Tuesday through um, Evanston Pioneer Press and also Chicago Tribune. We also post our bids on the city's website and we also utilize DemandStar. In your packet, you also find some additional information regarding um, DemandStar. Um, and depends on if you're currently a member of DemandStar, you can access their website and you can download their forms there, or again, you can come to the City of Evanston website. And if we have the document in electronic format, you can get it, access it there. You can call us, we can email it to you if we have it in electronic format. Some, uh, most of the bids for um, construction projects, we're still working with the department to get them in, uh, in an electronic format for you guys and they can be pretty big, so um, it's a work in progress. So that's one of our goals that we're hoping to accomplish this year. But, um, okay. So again, DemandStar is one of the outlets that we use to get the notification of a new bid that's out, bid or proposal or RFQ. Um, it lists the name of the bid, the bid number, the day it's broadcast, the due date, and the name of the project. And depending on if you have um, membership with DemandStar, you can access the details of the project and also receive the documents itself. And we have the City of Evanston link as well, which will also link you to the same information and same documents if you're not a member of DemandStar. And this is just a little, um, this is a screenshot of what you would see um, before you decide to purchase or if you are not a member or what you would receive um, if you are a member. And it just, again, lists the agency and the type of bid or RFP or RFQ. The bid, um, the bid writer, the name of the bid, the status, and as we advance through the process, that status is going to change on the website. It goes from active to under um, evaluation to awarded, or if there's any other reason, um, there's other um, reasons you might see if it was pulled or maybe the bid was canceled or some reason like that. So they will update their site to give you that information to, to let you know what status the bid or RFP is at. Yes. Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, and now I have to come up here, otherwise the cameraman gets uh, gets upset. Uh, can I have a show of hands? How many folks um, have used Demand Start? Oh, great. That's fantastic to see. I was really afraid there'd be like two hands go up out of 50. <laughs> um, but for those of you that don't, we'd like some feedback about other um, utilities out there that you use. Your business people, you're accessing your customers in a certain mm -hmm. way. So um, as a part of, at the end of the um, presentation today, for I, I think everybody would love to know how it is you do access um, your customers. So for those of you not using DemandStar, because we are looking at options this year, and not that we're dissatisfied with DemandStar, we just should always keep on looking at our options. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And oh, and since I did do the interruption now, uh, Alderman Tendum. Uh, Alderman oh. Tendum is in the back as well, and uh, I also did not introduce um, Shannon Sher Sharif. Uh, Sher Sher she is right here. Uh, why would I introduce Shannon? She is our accounts payable person, so she's the one cutting the check. So you always want to put a name to a face on the person cutting the check. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knew who that was. Thank you. Sorry. For um, no problem. Thank you. And also. Um, there's a form in the back of your packet for, um, there's a survey, so we are looking for input and information um, 
if you can share with us and we would like to build on this event and if you have other suggestions that we can use. So please fill out the survey before you leave or if you can mail it back to us, it would be greatly appreciated. So again, uh, just, uh, we, um, keep moving. So <clears throat> again, outstanding bids you can find on the City of Evanston website. You can, okay. um, again, here is where you can find the bid documents if you're not a, um, a member of Demand Star or if you're not in this area or if you just want to um, see the document. Um, you have access to the documents this way, um, free of charge. Some of you might be saying, why is all this information important? Is it, why is all of this information is important to you, or how can it help you to do business with the city of Evanston? Well, in 2014, the city's approved capital improvement plan was $40 million. So we have quite a few projects that we are looking to um, push out to you guys and um, we're hoping that we can access or this is a good outlet that if you have questions or just so you know what the process is and that you're able to bid on these di um, projects. So we have capital improvement um, projects totaling 40 million. These projects include roadway projects, water main, facilities, and related professional services. Also, the city budget um, for contractual, contractual services and commodities is $17.5 million. So this is why we're here this morning to get this information out to you in hopes that you will be able to um, bid on some of these projects. And right here is just a small sample of our first quarter CIP projects that in the next three months or so, you'll see these projects advertised. You'll see them on our website. Um, so hopefully it's something of interest to quite a few of you guys, and we hope to get some competitive pricing, competitive bidding going on. Yes. Okay, so like a quarterly update of um, yeah, CIP projects. Stuff, stuff okay. Like this. okay. Sure, okay. we'll um, take that. And if you can also include it on your survey, be greatly appreciated too. Did I see another hand? It's available in a different format. It is um, within the city budget appro approved budget. It's just a different format. Yes, the city budget is accessible. Okay, okay. also um, in your package, you should also have a document that's labeled um, under 20 purchases. And these are just some of the um, purchases the city throughout the year will be um, making. These um, projects include floor sanding, t-shirts for our summer, pro summer program, um, camp supplies for our summer programs, newsletter printing for Levy, <clears throat> and various other printing I'm sure would also come throughout the year, food purchases for the summer programs. Um, there's a Crown Center floor resurfacing project, and there's various projects within Crown um, that they're looking to do this year that are going to come in under 20. Um, there's bleacher improvements that they're looking to do, sound system upgrades, so there's a lot of under 20 spend out there also that we're hoping that minority and women and Evanston-based businesses can bid on. And let me know if you don't have that document, we want to make sure we get at least a sample of what we're looking for this year in your hands. Okay, and as um, we go to the next slide, which is the local preference um, slide, and the information I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna ask Sharon Johnson to make her way up. She's gonna give the second half of the presentation. Um, Sharon is our MWEBE 
um, compliance officer, and she handles, uh, makes sure the contractors, the project managers, everything is um, monitored and in line with the goals and policies that the city have in place. But before I um, give the mic over to Sharon, just also wanted to mention the local preference that we have in place here at the city of Evanston. And that ordinance is 15-0-78. Um, and that allows the city council to award bids or RFPs to local Evanston businesses if they come in within 5% of the lowest bid. And we also follow this practice for all of our under 20 bids. So departments are, um, they access you, you guys' information. They have to have at least three quotes if the purchase is under $20,000 and we require that they reach out to either a minority, a woman, or an Evanston business. So one of their quotes, under 20, should be from one of those selections. So, and also the local preference would fall into play as well. Now a little bit about the local preference. It has to be a business that's physically located here in Evanston and for more than a year, so. So, um, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Good morning, everyone. As Tammy mentioned, my name is Sharon Johnson, and I am the Business Diversity Compliance Officer representing the City of Evanston. Today I'm going to review the MWEBE and the LEP uh, preference that the City of Evanston has, and I'll just define uh, what each one is. To start off with, and I apologize for the people who already know this, MWEBE stands for Minority Women and Evanston-Based Businesses, just for uh, people who aren't familiar with some of the acronyms. So we have the uh, MWEBE program. It was created to uh, assist economic development for efforts for qualified minority owned businesses in the city of Evanston and women owned businesses for uh, local uh, boundaries within the city of Evanston. So as you can see, our city goal is to have eligible contracts that are at least 25% or above, and I can happily report that we have exceeded uh, that goal of 25%. Uh, we've gone roughly 7% above that, so we're doing quite well with uh, minority-owned businesses and their subcontractors. Certified MWE and WBE must be registered at one of the following, and we take these registrations, the city of Chicago, Cook County, uh, any of the Chicago Minority Supplier, Development Council, Women Development Business Center, and state and federal certifications. Also, why? Why these programs? The difference between the two, MWEB and LEP, are one is business oriented, the other one is people based. MWEB is for the local businesses. LEP stands for Local Employment Program, and that would be to assist the um, lower income to moderate income residents of Evanston. This is a program that we're working vigorously to uh, enhance at the present time since we're doing fine with the MWEB portion of our goal. So, I'll do the next slide. Thank you, Jonathan. To define, for example, an Evanston-based owned business, it's physically located here within the boundaries of Evanston, and it's certified by the city ordinance, section 1-171B. Next slide. And again, I stated this is to assist with the goal. We have a 25% goal for subcontracted work, and I'll talk just a little bit about the LEP program. You can go to the next slide. Again, LEP, oh, sorry, you have a question? I have a quick question about the Yes, ma'am. Are you already certified, or do you have to go through some 
Well, you should check with the city. Uh, we do have a requirement of at least a physical address here within a minimum of, I believe it's 12 months, within the city boundaries. You should check with us here at the city, and yes, there, there's something that we use to register to make sure that you're qualified and you can be put on the books to be uh, certified Evanston-based business. That's correct. And you can speak with me. I'll, I'll be around after for specifics. So back to our slide. For the LEP program, what it is, again, it's the local employment program that is Evanston-based for Evanston residents of low income to moderate income. And it's aimed at the construction projects, public works that are around the city that are valued at a quarter of a million dollars or more. And again, this creates the employment opportunities for low to income or moderate residents for Evanston, and it funds the construction projects. So, Insofar as the compliance is concerned, since we're trying to enhance this particular program, uh, what we'd like to have is verification, just to go over just a few points, of Evanston residents. They need to be certified with the city that they actually have an address here in Evanston. For the construction uh, contractor side, we'd like to see a minimum of 15% of the total project hours worked uh, by an Evanston resident for the contractor to be considered to be compliant, as well as a submission of the certified payroll. So we are working on that program again uh, this year, and there are penalties for non-compliance, but the committee is in the process of revising that, so I won't go into too much detail. But it's a rigorous program that does very well and has been supported by the city. Uh, the residents seem to be uh, very engaged in the process, and uh, we're grateful to have that in place now. Next slide, sorry. So this brings me to the end of our MWBE and LEP definition. And here's some information if you need to contact us where to get a hold of us on the fourth floor, purchasing office 4200, and the address, the email address, purchasing at cityofevanston.org, or you can call us at 847-866-2935. And that's it. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Under 20K for? For, you have to have at least three folks. Oh, do you want to speak to that? I'll bring Tammy up to speak to that. Just, you mentioned the under 20,000. Yes. What's the threshold you're looking at? And I was just wondering more information exactly what was that for? Um, that's for purchases under $20,000 for um, goods and services. Um, anything, again, falling under 20,000 that does not require city council's approval. So that can be above 1,500, but under 20. Um, again, just what about. Is, what is it that, why are you indicating that 20,000? What is it that you were looking for? I missed that part of the interview. Um, it's just the different tiers that we have of the bidding process for um, goods and services. So under 20,000, it just requires the three quotes um, three written quotes. Um, the department has to get at least one Evanston minority or women-owned <laughs> business to submit a, a quote as well. And it's awarded um, by the department pretty much and then a purchase order is is issued. So anything again over 20,000 requires the formal bid process and it has to go to council for approval. No, it's in the over 20. Well. Yes. 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 They're not posted anywhere technically. Um, it's just projects the department have on the horizon. Um, so we were trying to format some type of document to for a takeaway, so you know what is coming. Um, so that's something we can also work on 
on a quarterly basis, you know, um, updating as well. Very few, yes. And it depends on what the project is. Um, some of the projects over at Robert Crown, um, there's bleachers that are going to be um, refurbished, um, improved. I'm not sure all the specifications of that project, but that's under 20. Yes. There's not an actual list. You just um, make yourself available to um, introduce yourself to the departments. Um, they do submit a, a list to us that we push the bids and the RFPs out to, and um, just monitoring the city's web page, um, checking the Evanston Review and Chicago Tribune. Yes. You mentioned Tuesdays were the days that you do new announcements. Is that every Tuesday or? Not necessarily. Just when there's a new um, solicitation to go out. Yes. And it'll be on the website and the, the Tribune and the Correct. Okay. Yes. 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 I'm sorry, I left my documents. Um. It does qualify. Mm -hmm. Okay, that might be a slight typo, so let, we can um, it does clarify qualify, that information. Right. Oops. Yeah. Part of the, one, uh, the question, though, uh, the 250000 uh, limit for LEP is set by ordinance. Uh, that was $500,000 originally. Um, it, uh, because the way the local employment program is structured, it is for uh, originally envisioned as tradesmen working, trying to get more of our uh, skilled labor uh, working on our construction projects. When you get a project that has a total value at 250000 it might not even have um, 50 or 100,000 in labor and may have 150,000 in material. Then to break that down to say you only have a certain percent for local employment makes it difficult for you all as business uh, owners and um, you know contractors to comply. So we've been working with the 250 and there was some concern when we went from 500 to 250 that it wouldn't work. It's working. So we uh, um, the uh, uh, MWEB committee will certainly uh, look at those things. They get uh, reports on a routine basis now on how we are complying with our own MWEB and LEP programs. Yes. Um, the departments are required to get three quotes, so they're um, reaching out to businesses, contractors, and... Um, there's technically not a list. We do um, help the departments find um, resources if they have not or do, cannot um, find a minority or woman or Evanston business. There's not, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Okay, uh, number one, when, when, we, when we have a question, repeat the question for people to hear it, so if they ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, when we have, uh, so for instance, the folks who attended this um, seminar, we will have a list, and as uh, Tammy pointed out, when uh, our departments say, all right, I, I need to uh, have printing services done. Who do we have for Evanston businesses? They do contact purchasing, they do contact economic development, say, who's on a, who, who do we have that I can contact? As, because as she pointed out, one out of three must be 
in Evanston business if available. I mean, they, they, we don't stop them and say you can't buy if you can't find an Evanston business. We need to keep uh, purchasing in an efficient manner. Uh, I think you bring up a very good point, and that'll be something that we actually work on as far as getting more outreach where we could go with, uh, whether we call it a list serve arrangement or whether we go to um, pushing our under $20,000 purchases. For the most part, they happen the same time each year. So if we're gonna do a big office supply order, but that's only $15,000, we'll do it usually at, the, at a, a given time each year. Uh, so uh, we will certainly take that as a, uh, um, agenda item for us to be working on to push it um, we certainly can also more quickly work on posting it that here's what we're going to be doing um, as you pointed out we have our calendar mm -hmm. for big projects um, we can uh, start looking at our under 20 spend as we call it um, and say when is it happening so that then we could post it because what we don't want to do is clog our web page with too much stuff then nobody will read it if you have to filter through too much stuff so we will want to try and make it um, you know uh, appropriate for the time when we're going out and we also don't want you looking at something and then someone saying oh that's not going to happen for six months then you've wasted some of your time so um, I think it's a good idea also um, when the departments do submit their request for a um, purchase order we do um, go through the documents we go through their backup and if we do not see a minority or woman or Evanston business we'll push it back to them you have to have this so we do follow up with the departments as well I have actually two questions one is so it's on a department by department basis so let's say this room wanted to paint this room that department is responsible for the maintenance or whatever would put this out the bid versus somebody want to do business cards in another area, they would do it themselves. Is that, is that why it's sort of fractured in that? We prefer to say decentralized rather than fractured. <laughs> <laughs> yes, decentralized. So that's my first question. So it's sort of, and then secondly, as a contract, general contractor, what's the average uh, outstanding payable time for them? So if I'm invoicing, how long am I going to wait for my money? First, uh, Shannon, um, Shannon stepped away, but we do follow the Prompt Illinois Payment Act, so that gives us 30. Uh, no, the prompt payment is 60, uh, and uh, we're somewhere between 30 and 45. We're between 30 and 45 days, typically. Take that. And, and Laura, <laughs> did, 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 uh, did we introduce Laura? I so Laura Biggs did. is in our water department, so uh, somebody, and she does a lot of their capital work. Mm -hmm. um, and also what might be involved in the purchasing of major supplies, but sometimes hers are specialized. So I don't know if we have any uh, water meter manufacturers in the audience, but she'd be the one that buys 200 of them a year so that we have a stock to replace our thousands of, of meters in a, in a given year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I find it very confusing, but again, since we've been to this meeting, are we on this list? So any, any uh, bids that go out there, we're going to be automatically no that's not what i said i i, I do want to work on that that was since we because that's part of our feedback that we're working on this time around to continue to expand that and start pushing the bids out um, it, it should and the other thing is it, on the web page you should have a, you know a link and here here's the upcoming uh, project either under twenty thousand or over there should be one little link mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to go from the department to and that is a suggestion that was made as well. So that's something we will um, look into getting um, updated. And also on your survey, we're asking what type of um, service or business you are. So if you can give us that, and we're going to um, look for ways to use that information to better serve you guys. And, and you know, th those kinds of questions, we want them. You know, the, it's OK to say you should be doing something different. We want to hear about it. We want to make the changes. So. Uh, if we say we're working on it or if we say we do it this way, we still want you to push us. That's something that, that should be happening. And we contact the chamber also, that they're such a good resource for us to face businesses. Yes, well, what, one of the, uh, the, the question was, should we have the chamber I think, uh, involved? I think that's really a link between the two, where you know, chamber, as a part of their duty, should be checking our website 
and saying, gee, as a part, because they're a fee service. So they should be checking our website or all of these folks' website and saying, did you know this is what's going on in the community? That's, to me, a value-based service that the chamber can also augment in this situation. Uh, he was first. Yes. Was first. I was contacted on a large job here in Evanston. That was the facades for your two parking garages in downtown Evanston. Uh, I would just like to be helpful. That's a very specialized thing. You must have sent it out to all the architects who are listed as being in town. It was a big mistake on the part of the city. I hope you succeeded in receiving proper proposals. But that I found out in the course of that, I'm a licensed architect, that the people who are doing that kind of work are very few. Now that the firms involved in that nationwide. So here you were asking local architects to go through this whole process they were not capable, as I was not capable, of carrying out the bid requirements. And not only that, uh, I would uh, have to uh, round up a specialized team in order to give you the documents necessary. And not only that, you were not aware that any time you submit a proposal on any specialized aspect of the building, most reviewers demand to see all the other problems in that building. So the big part of it is surveying the building, particularly buildings of that size. I was just curious if you succeeded in getting proper uh, bid proposals because I, for one, didn't bother to go forward. Everyone I talked to, even in the business, looking at what you were requiring, said, no, we don't go forward and spend the time. Happy you're here. So I'm really happy Lara Biggs made it because uh, what the gentleman brings up is one of the, the things that we have to try and balance where we try to reach out to as many folks because we don't want to assume that someone's not qualified. We want uh, businesses to grow into qualifications. You may, to, may not have been qualified for a given project, but how will you know that you want to pursue that qualification? You aren't going to do it on the, you know, if I'm using Vegas terms, you're not going to do it just in case uh, maybe I'll win. You want to see that there's business out there. If you're going to go get a specialty certification, you want to know that there's a payback for that. So, also, sorry, to with the demand star, you look at that, you can see um, architects from all over the country bidding on certain specialized. Sure. Companies. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what we do in some cases, for instance, uh, what's the one that we do? It's at CIPP that we have the. Sure. So for, Yeah, a, and I'm just talking because I'm on the camera and on the mic. So, but it, so cured in place, so they literally blow the lining in, and then it cures in place. So uh, once every four years, we send out um, a request for qualifications. Are you qualified? Whoever comes back and is qualified are the only ones we're going to contact specifically for that bid because we've qualified them, and from a liability perspective and a performance perspective, we've made sure we're covered. I want to check our time. We're doing great on time. But I, you bring up a very good point well, the that. The thing I follow up on is I'm just curious as to how was your bid for uh, your, uh, asking for bids on those two projects? Did the city get bids and yes. give some of the contracts? Yes, we did. And in those kinds, of, so for this facade project that he's talking about on the uh, on parking decks, we did have support from both our internal architect and from external architects um, in the process. Uh, we do it in situations where we say, if you're going to advise us on a bid, you can't bid. Obviously, you know, we don't want to give somebody a leg up on a project, so we may have uh, professional firms helping us on setting up the big project, but then they're excluded from the big project. That can happen. For the most part, we do have, we're of a size city that we do have um, engineers um, architects, they may not be using their PE on a daily basis, but they are trained to be able to create the specifications in a manner where we can say, all right, you must have these qualifications to do this job. Um, again, we don't want to preclude, we don't know always that somebody just moved into town that could do the job. So we don't want to always do our RFQ. We would like to make our, uh, our business process as inclusive as possible. Well, in doing that, trying to be as inclusive as possible, 
my professional opinion, I'm a lifetime architect, who spread their net too wide to discourage people who might have been bidders as I tried to find them to help me out. And you, I thought, were messing up. That's why I asked if you were actually award that contract, which was a massive yeah, we, we awarded the contract. It came in under budget, uh, so it was a successful um, project. Uh, one more question, and then we will take questions at the end, for the, or you can come up and talk with any uh, city representative, and we'll get ourselves on track. I have an MWPP question. I know. Fire away. We'll see who's got the answer. Uh, it, it lists that the goal is to have eligible contracts. I'm just wondering what's an example of a contract that's not an eligible contract for the 25 percent when there is no possibility for subcontracting. So thank you. I just told her we should repeat the <laughs> questions that I forgot to. Um, so the question is um, that uh, what would be a contract in which uh, it wouldn't be eligible for the 25% goal MWEBE, and that's where the, the contract was such that there was no subcontracting potential. Um, and, and we've been stretching that. Uh, I'll pick on my uh, line of work, finance. Nobody thought we could do an auditing contract, which is about eighty to ninety thousand dollars, with an MWEBE component, because the auditor has a fiduciary responsibility and a compliance responsibility to own all the work. But we did it. We now use two auditors. One is a, a, a WBE, and they do one part of the audit, and another um, and then another firm does you know the major part of the audit. But uh, that's a fluid thing, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, we just say, well, if, it, if, if the vendor tells us there's no subcontracting, eh, that's not our source. We try to examine it ourselves as to whether there's options. And they do have to prove there's no chance of subcontracting by going through certain forms, doing certain contacts, checking in with us on lists. So we do try to make sure that they've made a good faith effort to prove no, you know, no possibility for subcontracting. Uh, I'd like to move on with our, uh, Tammy, do you have anything else? No, no yeah, nothing she's else. She's, she's <laughs> being my good timekeeper. So, in, in so when they go like this, that means stretch it out. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They go like this. <laughs> uh, okay. Signs uh, at the I back of the room. <laughs> okay. Um, the next um, presenter that we would like to bring before you is Jim, Jim Conrad Tom. from Northwestern University. Please uh, help welcome Jim. That's not it. <laughs> no. Nope. It's actually a PDF. It's not a PowerPoint. That's it. Oh, because it's not a PowerPoint. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I think. Um, I think what I'll be focusing on today is a little more about the strategy behind procurement at Northwestern. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I'll get into quite the level of detail that the city did, um, but I think you'll hear some very similar things. You know, we might do things a little different, but I but I think you'll hear some similarities. Um, you know, our our campus is very decentralized, not fractured. What was the word that was used? It's very decentralized as well, but I really like how we've improved in the last five years or so. We, uh, I think probably at one time, we didn't have a very central procurement strategy. And so when policy says you're required to get three bids, it is, that is a requirement of the departments and schools to get three bids. I know that question came up over here. Um, and so that's what they got. They got three bids, right? Didn't matter that there were 50 vendors who could do the work. They invited three people. And I think what we've done in central procurement is when we're involved in a procurement, we rarely, we really err on the side of including the vendors we've met who provide those products and ser services. To your point, we do cast, try to cast a pretty wide net. And it's up to the department, or it's up to the vendor to decide whether they want to submit a proposal or not. But we do cast the net as wide as we think we can. Um, so anyway, just a couple, couple lead-in comments before I get started. The other thing I wanted to mention is I will talk 
about construction. I don't work for facilities. We do a lot of work to support facilities management. But, you know, with regards to like more significant employment programs or preferences or subcontracting based programs, you know, that, that's stuff that, that's conversation that takes place at a much higher level than, than me, okay? Um, the president, the mayor, there's a lot of people talking about how uh, we all can work better together on large construction projects. I'm sure you've read the news, you, you've seen the news, we have some pretty big projects coming up over the next five years. And, and, and I won't be able to speak to some of that conversation, but I, I will, will be able to tell you how we support facilities management. And I think, personally, I think you'll hear some good things. Okay, go ahead. There you go. Um, so over the last few years, I think we have implemented what we call a much more structured and strategic pro procurement envi environment, which I hinted at in the past. Um, our office is now considered that single point of contract for central procurement, but that doesn't mean we do all the bids. I know the conversation about how to find opportunities, the whole push-pull mentality. Uh, ours is definitely a push system. At this time, we don't have a site that people can go check every day to see if there's bid opportunities. We are looking at how we might be, be able to create a little more visibility into things going on. But right now, if, if we're involved in managing the bid process, we send it to the vendors we've met um, and have provided us information that we keep in a database. We invite those vendors to submit a proposal and any vendors the department or school might ask us to include. Uh, so it's definitely just be you know, right up front with you. It is more of a push strategy at this point. Um, our role is to really help departments and schools make informed best value purchasing decisions. So we do that by, and I've got a couple other slides on this, strategically sourcing on behalf of the university and helping departments and schools do bids. It is not required that departments send bids to us and have us do them, um, ever. Whether it's less than $20,000 or whether it's a uh, million dollars. If the department or school is capable of soliciting those proposals, we do allow them to do that, but we're the final approver, so we get a chance to see how that process was performed and how they made their decision. Um, our goal is to save departments and schools time and money. As you can imagine, at a, at a university, uh, uh, the priority of our people at the school is to teach and do research. Our goal is to set up contracts and, and manage the procurement process in, uh, in a way that allows them to focus on teaching and research, not buying pens and, and anything else they might need. That's where, our, um, that's where we come in. Okay. Uh, again, we do delegate uh, activities to departments and schools, so obviously we don't decide what the Center for Comparative Medicine needs to run their operation, they do. And when they have a need to buy a product or service, they can go get the quotes themselves, they can reach out to us and have us help them do that, and that's happening more and more often, by the way, because they, they understand that that's our area of expertise. <clears throat> but then when it comes time to actually buy that product or service, they go into the system, initiate a requisition, and if it's over $25,000, we are the final approver before that purchase order gets sent to the vendor. So uh, we're not, we don't have to be actively involved in every step of the, the RFP or ITB process, but we will see it before it becomes official. So if we have some of the same questions or concerns, we can jump in and, and, and do something about it. Um, we provide all different types of support. So I've got three listed here. One is if a department as a small purchase and they're just looking for some advice from us, we will give them that advice. <clears throat> if a uh, department is uh, key, uh, intent on managing the RFP process on their own, but they would like someone from purchasing to be involved, uh, we will sit at the table and help them through that process, even though they're kind of taking the lead on it. Um, the third thing I have listed is, is they have a need, they reach out to us, and we manage that entire process for them with them present at the key points in time. <clears throat> that clearly is our strength. That clearly is where we've been going as a university because, again, that's, that's, that's our area of expertise. Our expertise is not lab animals. Our expertise is purchasing. 
So we have more and more departments reaching out to us saying, hey, we need a contract for something. Can you help us go through that process? And that's, and that's when we do. And we have templates with you know, requirements in terms of conditions and process steps, uh, much like the city. Um, again, our, our, we're the final approver, so our, more of our systematic or policy responsibilities, we're that final approver for all purchases over $25,000. So uh, we may not have been involved, but we have a lot of insight into the process that, that we went through. Okay, so, so this whole, you know, some of the conversation I heard during the city's conversation uh, presentation was about, you know, sometimes where you have to draw those lines, the, the $20,000 line, hey, bids under 20,000, we handle more informally, the department can do them themselves. If it's over 20, it jumps over to us and we handle it more formally. Unfortunately, a lot of times from a peer process perspective and time management perspective, you have to, you have to draw a line somewhere. Um, where we, where, where our primary responsible, responsibility is, is this idea of strategic sourcing. So. Our goal, our job is when we need a contract for office supplies, we don't need a box of pens, okay? We have people on campus who buy pens every day. So them having to go through a process to get quotes on pens and paper and things like that is not practical. So what we do is we spend a lot of time going out and meeting vendors, diverse vendors, local vendors included, and when it's, our, when it's time for us to establish a contract for one of those things, then we're the ones who include those vendors in that process. So we'll put a bid out for office supplies. It's a five-year contract. We spend two to three million dollars a year on office supplies. We go through an exhaustive RFP process. We have Department of School representatives involved in evaluating those proposals, and we pick a vendor together. And from that point forward, this is our contract for office supplies, and this is who everyone uses. Except our mandate is, is not is fairly soft in policy. In other words, we do have the occasional professor who is bound and determined to walk up the street to CVS to buy their envelopes. They can do that. So people are gravitating towards these contracts because it makes sense, but by policy there is some wiggle room there if a, if, if a department or school is interested in kind of doing something different. Does that make sense? Or I'm not trying to sound too wishy-washy or all over the place, but we have a, a lot of very independent people at Northwestern University, and, and, and that's why we wrote the policy the way we did. So, um, but strategic sourcing is trying to see what is our total spend in this area as a university, and let's try to go out and do an extensive RFP and get a good contract or contracts in place for those things to make it easier for people to buy those things when they need them. So we, we look at our spend reports, we talk to departments and schools, um, and then we have these formal documents that we use. We call it invitation to bid that has requirements and terms and conditions and the process we're gonna go through. Um, you can see I made a note here. Uh, you know, if, if we've met a vendor that sells office supplies, they're gonna get invited. I mean, it's just, it's just a no-brainer. Um, and that's the way we carry ourselves. So we, when I say erring on the side of including vendors, that's what I mean by that bullet. We, we, we make it a priority to try to, does that mean we haven't missed a vendor? Of course not. Um, but if we've met them, chances are they're gonna get invited the next time we put that out to bid. Um, technically, that next time might not be for four years. I mean, just depending on the timing of it, but we will, we hold on to that information and I'll tell you how to get on that list. Uh, we hold on to that information and pull it out when it's time to put it out to bid. Um, uh, Tammy talked a little bit about this in, in the RFP part of it, but we never do a low bid award. Uh, all of our contracts are awarded based on best value. Sometimes it does end up going to the vendor who submitted the best price, but everything we look at is based on best value. So we look at prior experience, past performance, delivery capabilities, financial stability, pricing, delivery capabilities. We, we look at all that information in order to help us pick the best vendor for Northwestern. Um, when I was talking about the ease of ordering, um, this piece right here was huge for us because we didn't have a system like this in the past. We, uh, I'm not sure where Marty went, but we, five years ago, we implemented a new financial management system, PeopleSoft, and at the same time, we implemented an electronic marketplace, which we've named iBuyNU. 
And so many of the vendors that we award contracts to, we are able to pull their uh, web-based catalog into that tool to make it easy for our departments and schools to order uh, and make it easy for our vendors to get paid when we do order from them. So, um, and obviously after we award a contract, we manage that contract. So uh, that's what contract administration means. Okay. Um, I don't know if many of you, how many of you interact with the university now and have heard this term preferred vendors. This is really a byproduct of strategic sourcing. When we go through an RFP and we award a contract, that vendor ends up being termed a preferred vendor for Northwestern University. That's the only way they're determined to be preferred. We do business with thousands of vendors. There are only 100 preferred vendors. So we, you know, give you an idea, we, we spend a lot of money outside those vendors, but those are the vendors that we term preferred. Uh, we have lots of categories. Sometimes it's one vendor, uh, like in the case of office supplies. Other times it's more than one. Um, for example, copiers, um, uh, computers. You know, we, we, we will never get the campus to agree <coughs> on one computer that everyone will buy. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just not going to happen. So, so we, we might award one, two, or three contracts, and office furniture is another one, and we let departments and schools to, choose, to pick from those vendors when they have to buy something. Some of them will just go to one of the vendors because they have a comfort level. Some of them will reach out to all three and say, show me the, the best, the copier you would rec recommend to us. And they'll just go with the one that they like the best. So, um, um, another, a few other points. I'm sorry, go, can you go back one? Sorry. Um, a couple other points about preferred vendors. Again, these are, we're, we're, you know, when I, when I came to Northwestern, we didn't have a lot of contracts. And so, the point with preferred vendors is these are vendors that we've really awarded contracts to as a university rather than CCM and chemistry and HR all needed to kind of find their own vendor. This is us trying to take all that need, roll it into one process and establish a contract that everybody can use. And so it's establishing a contract as a university. It's, it's goods and services based. It's not vendor based. So, you know, every once in a while um, we'll get a call from a department and they'll say, well, can't you make Staples a preferred vendor? And we said, yeah, you know, that's just not how it works in that particular case. We did an RFP, Staples was invited, we picked Office Max. So that's, that's what we mean when we say it's not vendor based, um, it's, it's product and service based. Um, establishes a result of a formal process. Uh, again, speaking to the mandate part of it, are departments and schools mandated to use those contracts? No, but it's, it's, it's frowned upon now more than ever when they don't, because again, it affects the entire university if they're not using it. Um, using the preferred vendors obviously streamlines the entire procurement to payment process. It, it provides cost savings because when, we, when we're able to go out for bid and say we spend $3 million a year in office supplies, that means something to the vendor community, right? We get better proposals because of that. Um, it also minimizes risk to the university and conflict of interest concerns. As you can imagine, with 9,000 employees, uh, they know people. And we do have cases of things that come up where, you know, why did you pick that vendor? It's because there, there might have been a relationship there. And so when we've gone through an RFP and we've awarded a contract, they're used to that, that conflict of interest question never comes up, right? They're just using the vendor's, con the contract that we have. So those are some of the benefits of the preferred vendors that, we, uh, that we've established. Um, and I'm just gonna say a couple, couple words about this because I don't want people to think that this is the only way we wanna do business. This is for the kind of the high volume everyday stuff that we buy. Um, I buy NU is this electronic marketplace. We have 40 catalogs in there. Uh, companies like Office Max, Dell, uh, VWR. We have um, Granger for you know for uh, facility supplies. Um, so it's an integrated part of our financial management system. It allows departments and schools to elect, send an electronic purchase order to the vendor after they've selected the items. It allows the vendor to send us an electronic invoice and it allows us to electronically pay them for those things we buy all the time. So hopefully you can see based on the last few slides why there are certain things that we buy <clears throat> where we need an infrastructure like this to get it done. Um, 
this was a big one, improved in consistent pr pricing. Uh, we have, we do business with all kinds of lab supply vendors and, and every department had a different price in some cases. And so our goal there was, listen, it's not $100,000 worth of spend and $20,000 worth of spend. It's $3 million worth of spend as a university, so everybody should benefit from the same price. And we were able to accomplish that with these catalogs as well. So you, you see this, everybody sees the same price. But there are other ways that departments and schools can buy. So if the, if, if the item, the product or service that's needed isn't in iBuyNU, we have a non-catalog requisition slash PO process. So you, it, it doesn't really take that much longer. It's just a little more manual. You've got a, I got my three bids, I initiate a requisition, it goes through workflow, and you get faxed to PO. Whereas with iBuyNU, I drop my items in a cart, it gets approved and the electronic PO goes to Dell or Office Mag. So the process is more streamlined, but the process is not that hard to buy something from a vendor that's not an I buying you. It's not overly complex. We also have a procurement card program. So we have people uh, across campus who have credit cards and there are certain things that they need to be buy that that just makes the most sense to use that credit card to buy. So, um, so anyway, I, I like to mention it only because I mean, this is our big push for, for our everyday things, but we spend a lot more money <laughs> than that. And we have, so we have streamlined ways to kind of get purchases done for those other things as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is probably the area of our business, I like to call it, that's probably increased the most, because we, we do have a nice portfolio of preferred vendors now. They expire every three to five years, and so we're, we have a schedule that, schedule as far as recompeting those so there is future opportunity for vendors um, but now we now that people see that we know how to do this process we get a lot of calls from departments and schools to help them establish a contract for something and so because they understand that we know that process and so um, obviously a more formal process leads to a more informed decision right um, we, you know, we do have departments who will meet with a vendor, like them, next thing you know they want to do business with them and it's a million dollars. It's like, no. I mean, you really need to compete that. You need to define, require, there's, there's value in taking a step back and managing that process, inviting other vendors, defining requirements, and people really are seeing that that's beneficial to them. Um, and again, and that, and including vendors in that process is a priority for these type of contracts as well. So. Okay, the next couple slides are, are <coughs> more specific. Uh, these are four areas of interest that were given to us by the city. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of them. Um, printing, we, we've kind of managed that a few different ways. Uh, kind of, we have kind of a tiered approach to printing. We have, and there's opportunities for vendors in all of them. The first one is just like your straight copying service, you know, I mean, we, we have a need to send out high volume copy jobs. And so we did an RFP and we awarded a contract to Quartet, which is a local vendor for those services. So departments and schools can take their large copy projects there, they do the work and then um, invoice the department. Um, we have a uh, competitively bid contract for business cards, letterhead and envelopes. Um, that's more of a branding marketing decision uh, when people go off and buy their own business cards from wherever they want we lose our branding we lose our identity all the cards everything looks different and so our department of university relations they want you know they want more consistency to the formal stuff that goes out so we have a more formal contract for those things and then we have a pre-qualified list of printers and and this is for all that other stuff you know the brochures the you know, we, we buy a lot of that stuff, view books. So what we did is we did an RFP and established a pre-qualified list of, let's say, eight printers. And departments and schools are free to use any of the eight. We have contracts with all of them. They've been pre-qualified. We just encourage them to get two, maybe a quote from two or three of them. But they don't have to worry about terms and conditions, anything. They just say, hey, I need a 1,000 of these. They get a quote. They say, I need a 1,000 of these printed by this time. Uh, and whoever gives them the best deal, that's who they go with. So does that make sense? Kind of a three-tiered approach for the different type of print jobs. Uh, when it comes to fleet and motor pool, our, you know, our motor pool is not as big as it used to be. Uh, we do not have a daily fleet anymore. We, the only thing that's really managed through the motor pool now is 
those permanent places, placements, like you know, like the athletic director's car, whoever's provided a car, it's all managed through the motor pool. The daily fleet now is actually uh, enterprise. So people still contact the motor pool to reserve a vehicle, but that vehicle comes from enterprise. Um, and so we don't maintain any of them anymore. Um, facilities does have a fleet of vehicles, and so t for maintenance and parts, uh, I think there's an opportunity for local Evanston vendors. Um, we don't have contracts for any of those things, and so when, when, when somebody needs to buy a part for a car or have it serviced, you know, that's a perfect place to look local, right? Um, to have that work done. Um, and I can get you contact information for, for the motor pool and facilities if you're in that area of business. Um, professional services in IT, this really, when I talked about establishing contracts on behalf of departments and schools, a lot of them are for professional services, right? Kellogg needs a new marketing partner. They're rebranding, you know, they're always looking at ways to improve. Um, they reached out to us and said, can you help us go through an RFP? and pick a vendor to be our partner to, 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 to map out this new marketing plan for Kellogg. And so uh, departments and schools can do some of that on their own, but they're reaching out to us for help more and more often. Um, and same with IT. We do a lot of, much like we support FM, which I'm going to get to next, we, we, we support IT a lot too. Um, so they have a campus-wide need for a IT solution. They will have us manage the process, the RFP process, to select that vendor. And, uh, and finally, facilities management. The, the, again, there's a little more of a, a portfolio approach here. Uh, there, again, there's certain things we need every day. Paint, uh, tools and hardware, plumbing supplies, electrical supplies. We work with them to issue a formal RFP to award contracts for those things, and then we pull those catalogs into iBuyNU. And so we have contracts for all those things because those are things people need to buy every day. Um, we, we also, and this is where I think there's a lot of opportunity for local vendors. The, the FM was also struggling on, not the capital, capital projects are big, right? We don't handle those. FM uh, design and construction releases those RFPs and they get contracts with general contractors. So some of the subcontracting opportunities there, I think, is that's the conversation that's occurring at a much higher level than me. Uh, you know, that's all handled by FM, and I think they do publish those on their website. So if we have a big construction project, you can go to FM's website, and I have those on the last slide, a contact information. Um, you, can, you can see what big projects they have coming up. <laughs> but when it comes to the smaller projects, FM was really having a hard time getting those processed in a, in a, in quickly to get the vendor on site doing the work because we had a requirement that all purchases over, all construction projects over $250, no comma, 250 period, um, required a signed contract. And so they would get quotes for a $5,000 plumbing project and then it would take a month to get the contract written and signed. And so what we did, and, and you don't have to be on this pre-qualified list to, to do business with Northwestern, but if you are, and we open that up every year for new vendors to, to submit qualifications to be on that list, um, it, it really incredibly streamlines the process for FM to use one of those vendors. So if they have a $10,000 plumbing project, they'll invite the vendors from the plumbing category of that pre-qualified list to come in, give them a quote, and Whichever one they go with, they can start working right away because we already have the contract with them. All these pre-qualified vendors have a contract with Northwestern. So I don't know how many folks here are, are construction-related vendors, but if you are, I mean, we should get your information so we can, if you're not on that list, we can include you next time. Because every year we refresh that list to give new vendors an opportunity to get on it. So um, is there a question? We, um, we, we didn't do it this fall, this past fall, but it's, it, it's tended to be in the fall. So we would start it in like October and we'd be done by January, February, and we refresh the list and we do it again. Now we're working with FM on when they want to do it again. I have a feeling it's going to be this spring we're going to start that. So the timing is, is good if you're interested in being a part of that process. Do I have to get going here? 
Um, uh, kind of, <laughs> or you're hiding a hook some, or something. Okay, next slide. I'll try to speed this up. Uh, I was also asked to um, see if I could identify some things coming up. Now, the only thing I can speak to is the things we know about, right? So th this is a list of things coming up in this calendar year. Uh, whether something bleeds into the following year or not, don't hold me to it. But these are things that are on our radar for this year, either contracts that we don't have yet or contracts that are expiring <clears throat> where it's just time to rebid it um, and you can see some big ones there right um, when we get contracts in place for flooring and office furniture just so you understand how that hooks into FM2 when they're when they're doing an RFP for a new building they hire a general contractor to manage that project but that general contractor will get quotes from our three preferred vendors for office furniture for that project. Does that make sense? So there is a, there is a bit of a hook there um, for the things where it makes sense for us to have our own contracts for. The same might happen for flooring. You know, we currently don't have a contract for flooring, but it's time for one or two for, you know, carpet and things like that. Um, but catering, I think, is probably a good opportunity for some local vendors. Uh, promotional items, janitorial supplies. So as you can see, we've, we've got quite a mix of things here that we're going to be working on this year. So, okay, here I go. Um, unfortunately, there you go. Um, one more back. Our system right now is a financial management system. It's not a place where vendors can go register saying, hey, I sell X, so next time you do a bid, include me. Uh, that's not how it works. It'd be great if it did, but that's not how it works. And so what we do is, and I printed some of these, then I thought, I'm not going to hand them out. You can get them from our website because it's easier to fill this out electronically and hit submit than filling it out in paper and sending it to us. But what we do is, when we meet vendors, we encourage them to go register through this process, and you end up in a database that we manage internally within purchasing. And so this is the list of vendors I'm referring to that we've met. So when we're going to do a bid for something, we access that list and make sure those vendors are included in the bid process. Um, we also will give name, those vendors' names to departments and schools if they ask. So, Because remember, since it's decentralized, sometimes departments and schools are gearing up to buy something, and we don't know it. And so they might, they might contact us and say, hey, do you know a few vendors who sell X, Y, or Z? And we'll, we'll usually make the pitch. It's like, hey, do you want us to help you with that? Um, and sometimes they do. Other times they say, you know, it's pretty simple. I can just get quotes. Just send me some vendor names. We'll pull vendors off this list and send it to them. So there is tremendous value in you getting to know us, getting us your information so we can put you in this database. Okay? So. We have another program that started out as geared more towards uh, students, then faculty and staff. It's called the Wildcard Advantage Program. What we're finding is an, it's an opportune place to put some vendors uh, for use by departments in school as well. And I'll give you a couple examples. Every once in a while, somebody has a picture that they need framed. It's like, well, we don't have a contract for framing a picture, and we probably never will. So to us, it makes sense to get that information, get them enrolled in the Wild Card Advantage program, and then just promote that. So if a department or school has a picture that needs to be framed, they can just go to that list, find a framer, um, and be done with it. So, because I don't anticipate we'll ever do a bid for, for that kind of thing. Um, so all that information is available on um, Northwestern's website as well. If you just go to our site and type in Wildcard Advantage, it'll take you right to that screen and tell you how to get involved. Okay, last, I think this is the last thing I want to mention. Um, there are a few things that you need to know, just like the city has process, we have process, you know, so a few things to keep on your radar when, you, when you're doing business with us is we are PO driven. Um, there's a lot of risk to vendors if they come on site, do work, deliver a product without a PO. So you really want, if you're interacting with a department or school, you really want to make sure that the end result of that conversation, if they're going to do business with you, is that you get issued a formal PO from, uh, from Northwestern for that product or service. That's our commitment to pay. That's how we make sure you get paid 
after you deliver the product or, or um, provide the service. So very PO driven. Um, obviously you have to be in our system. So if you're not in our system at the time the department wants to use you, they will have to go through a process of collecting information from you and submitting it so you can be added to our system and be paid, actually be issued a PO and then paid. Um, invoices should be sent to accounts payable. That's the best way to make sure it gets paid. Uh, as you can imagine, we, we, had a, we had some problems with that because when vendors send an invoice to the department, sometimes that person leaves, doesn't come back, took in another job, ended up in the top drawer of their desk. Three months later, you're trying to find out why hasn't this been paid? Um, you know, they have to sign off on that invoice and send it over to accounts payable. If you send it right to accounts payable, it's it's, it's much more likely to be paid in a timely manner. Uh, it's not to say all departments do a bad job, but it, it, uh, it, it introduces risk to you uh, by handling it that way. Um, receivers uh, are required, and again, every once in a while we'll get a call from a vendor saying, hey, why haven't I gotten paid? The POs, they've been issued the PO, AP has entered the invoice, still not paid. Well, the department, has to go into the system and do a receiver within the system saying, I got this, it's okay to pay it. We, we've scaled that back that a little bit for things under $500, so those small things can just be paid. But there are, I'm, I'm mentioning these things just so you're informed on how we do business because it's not always exactly how it might seem. Northwestern's just not paying their invoices. There's things that have to happen to make sure that process goes smoothly, and these are those things. Um, if, you've, if you are going to do business with a department or school and you present them with a contract to sign, understand that they probably have no authority to sign that contract. Um, they would need to take it, route it through legal, and legal will forward it to the right place to sign. Um, there is risk in providing work to the university if you don't have that PO or if the contract is not reviewed by legal and, and signed by the appropriate person. So. Um, and then part of, part of the process of doing business with Northwestern, we always get a copy of in, insurance, which most of you have, so it's not an issue. But understand that usually we ask for a copy of your insurance certificate uh, before you can do any work. And then I think I just have a summary slide I can go through pretty quick. Again, our goal is to help departments and schools select good vendors, uh, save time and money, minimize risk to the university. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for local businesses. They re really, it, it, it might sound, I know it came up over here, was like, well, how am I supposed to know what all departments and school, departments within the Evanston are doing? Um, it, it, it's just, it is what it is. It's good to stay in touch with departments and schools that you think need your products, and it's good to keep in touch with us as well, because sometimes the department's gonna handle it, sometimes we are. So, uh, and that's just the way in which we're organized. Um, Keep in touch with us uh, and remember those business processes I put on the previous page. Because if we're, if we're going to do business with a vendor, um, we want them to get paid. That might sound strange, but it, I can tell you with some of our previous processes that was not happening. We were, it was, we were, doing, we were ordering things and things were not getting paid and I think we've improved that about a thousand percent with some of our new systems and stuff. But it's important that you keep those process steps in mind, so. I think that's all I have. Uh, yeah. We have no local preference, but uh, again, I think that's, uh, um, I, I used to work in government for the state of Michigan, so I'm familiar with preferences. Uh, but that's a piece that's really kind of being discussed at a different level than me. I, I, I'm sure it's come up. I don't know. I, it, it, it does if, um, in, in more of a best, it's not formulaic. It's, it's more like the, in the case of quartet, let's say. You know, when we were looking at proposals from FedEx and all, you know, many of the big players, you know, it just came down to, it just, this just makes sense. You know, Quartet was the right vendor for us. They didn't need a 5% preference to win it. You know what I mean? So, yeah, there's, no, there's nothing formal like that, but it does come into play. I mean, all things being equal. Huh? Is it, uh, is that free enterprise? Well, maybe you guys switch on it. There used to be, they all 
Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's any Evanston-based bus companies that can provide the, <coughs> the number of buses that we buy. But we would we'd give them a shot if there was. So, um, but no no formal formulaic preference. But it does come into play when we're evaluating proposals if it makes sense. Does that help? You, you, that, that should be one of your primary contexts. And they have two departments. Uh, if, there you go. Um, operations, that's the smaller projects. Um, and, and when I say smaller, they can still be quite big. Design and construction are, they're building the new music building, right? Um, they're, they're really focused on the big projects. So it's really important to keep in touch with both of them because they do a lot of their own, own bidding. So is there one over here? Yeah, well, we'll ask you to resubmit. So if you're already on the list or you, or if there's a vendor out there, because we had a lot of construction vendors that didn't get put on. It's important to remember that these are pre-qualified lists. They're not, it's not a registration process, it's a pre-qualification process. So we're looking at pricing and all those things. Um, if, if, if somebody submitted in the past and they're on the list now, or they submitted in the past and they're not on the list, or if you're a new vendor, we will, we will invite you to resubmit. You don't have to kind of guess and do that on your own. So the printing one is sometime this spring where we'll be uh, reaching out to all the printers we've met and, and giving them a chance to resubmit um, their, their qualifications to be preferred. Does that make sense or? Okay. Uh, ask, anything else before yeah. I? I'll be around uh, till the end if, if you have questions afterwards too. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Folks, no, I'm just going to ask, and I appreciate, I don't want to try to keep us on track and also make sure that you get something out of uh, taking time away from your businesses. So if it's okay, we're going to take a quick little five-minute break, ask you all to stretch your legs if you need to use the bathroom, also ask you to introduce yourselves to your neighbor as well if you have a quick question that you would like to ask one of our presenters. We're going to come back in exactly five minutes and get back on track. Thank you very much. And um, I've already had a brief discussion with, with the rest of our presenters, so we're going to truncate the presentations just so we keep to our time limit and make sure that the information that you hear is uh, very meaningful to you as well as your business. So without uh, further ado, our next uh, speaker is Mr. Scott Daniels, and he's the manager of Procurement Service Division with Rotary International. And when he comes to the mic, I'm going to respectfully ask that you hold your conversations and uh, give him your full attention. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. I think I'm going to deviate from the camp presentation. First of all, I just want to say that I'm very happy. Do I need to go back there? Okay. I tried. Can we jack this up at all? No, we're good. We're good. Uh, good morning again. Uh, my name is Scott Daniels. I'm the purchasing manager. Procurement Manager with Rotary International, located at Evanston, practically right down the street. And um, my job is today is two, twofold. My job at Rotary is to drive value for Rotary, number one. And number two is, is my job is to represent Rotary to you, the supplier community. And I want to talk today about what it takes to do business at Rotary. And uh, one of the nice things about being not first on the list, it gives you an opportunity to think about things. I want to uh, thank in particular, well, the whole organization for bringing us here, but Jim and I were comparing notes over here, and his processes are very similar to ours. We have, we have thresholds, and we have, uh, uh, like if it's over $10,000, you've got to go out for three bids, and all that type of thing. Uh, but what, what's most important for you is to be able to find out how to get your foot in the door at Rotary International. Before I launch into all this, I want to tell you, I've been in your shoes. I have been a small business person. I 
had my own consulting business for a couple of years, and, and I found, I thought being in procurement my whole life, practically, uh, it'd be easy to slide into sales, and I found that it was not easy at all to slide into sales. Getting your foot in the door is an extremely challenging thing to do. And it's not that there's evil people at the other end of the telephone. It's not that there's people that are trying to get in your way. What it is, is, is people like me are focused on trying to get through their day, trying to get their jobs done, trying to, trying to just drive that value and uh, trying to make things happen. And when somebody comes along that can solve a problem, that can bring home a solution, it's like, hallelujah, I'm home, you know? And, Finding that niche that you folks bring to the party is the challenge that you have, is getting your foot in the door. So how do you get your foot in the door at Rotary International? Let's see if this thing works. Well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna tell you what I wanna tell you, then I'm gonna tell you, then I'm gonna come back and tell you again. I'm gonna go all the way to the end of this thing, and I'm just going to just say very briefly, oops, uh-oh. I screwed up. Well, anyway, thank you. If you want to get your foot in the door at Rotary International, you need to contact me. It's as simple as that. I'm very, my, my organization is very similar to Jim's organization in that, in that we're very decentralized. We have at Rotary uh, 530 people in the building on Sherman. We have uh, 750 people roughly worldwide. We have 1.3 million members spread all over the world. We're growing dramatically right now in Asia. Um, we ship the Rotarian magazine, which I brought a copy of it, and it's over on the desk over here. Um, we ship that all over the world. We have a circulation of about 440,000 copies. We, we are very much a worldwide organization. That said, we have a building in Evanston that needs to be fed with goods and services. And I'll find it here in the presentation. There we go. That building in Sherman, again, has got 530 people in it. It was bought in 19, 19, 1977. It was, became Rotary in 1988. It has 369,000 square feet. It has people. It provides jobs. Uh, we have uh, around 600 tenants that are in that building requiring services. Uh, the thing, when I did this last year, that was really, uh, I was surprised. People were amazed that we pay about $1.8 million in property taxes per year to the community. So we drive a lot of value here to the Evanston community. Uh, we do, we do uh, uh, fire. Uh, drills there, we're partnering with the city. We also have a warehouse in Lincolnwood, which has got 28,000 square feet. Uh, we have, again, the international offices. So we have this large presence worldwide, and we have this large presence here, here in town. So what do you folks, I'm imagining, I believe most of you probably be local suppliers. I can tell you about all the wonderful things that Rotary does, and I do want to speak about that for a minute. But Rotary International buys a wide array of diversified goods and services, worldwide in scope. Our top categories, if you look at our procurement, is events, travel, administration, information technology, mail and freight, marketing, branding, publications, and so on. But also, uh, I did a run of the things that we buy locally, and we buy a lot of stuff. We, of course, have the property taxes. That shows up as being a buy on my list. But repair and maintenance services. We have construction people, I know, that are in this area. Construction goods and services. Utility, hotels. We do a lot of trips. Right now, our directors are coming in from all over the world. I had to entertain a couple people from Denmark yesterday. They stay here in town. They stay at one of the hotels. Uh, there may be a possibility for doing like a side trip. I was talking to one of our, our, our uh, uh, members in the audience right before coming on up here. Maybe they could stay here locally afterwards. I mean, there might be an opportunity for you all. So a lot of what we do, you can see it's very corporate-like. It's very structured. It's you know, all arranged. We have our own travel group. 
but there's opportunities for these people as they come to town to branch out. They go to the local restaurants. We have a number of local restaurant uh, agreements that we have in place of people to deal with our restaurants on a preferred basis. We have events, we have recognition items, we have software, travel, insurance, banking services, and so forth. So the point of this presentation is, is that as you look at that building, and as you look at the people that reside there, as you look at, at what you do, your job is to get your foot in the door. And I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Your job is to call me, to email me, to reach out to me, recognize that I got a lot of priorities that are on my plate, as any buyer in any organization has, and be persistent. What I'll do is, is I will reach out internally, your organization, if I haven't talked to you before, pardon me, and I will try to find out who in that organization is, is the decision maker. It's probably not me. For most of the people in this room, it's probably not me. It's probably somebody else in the organization in this decentralized sphere that is actually making that decision. I review all the POs, I approve all the vendors. I, as in my department, I have a team, a really great team that does that. But in order to make that decision process go, we need to get you to sell to that primary decision maker. And I can see if there's an opportunity. I can't make a promise. Many of these goods and services have been done by people, perhaps locally even, over the years, and there's already established relationships. That makes it tough. It makes it tough for you to be able to drive a value proposition. But our group is here in order to try to facilitate that process and make it as fair and equitable as we possibly can. Again, I can go to the end of the slide. My name is Scott Daniels. I'm the procurement manager with Road International. If you have any questions now or later, I brought my business cards. Uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Scott, thank you very much for your presentation and helping to keep us online. Uh, the next person that I would like to introduce to you is Ms. Bonnie Kent uh, from District 65. Thank you very much, Ms. Kent. Um, good morning. Um, I'm not used to speaking to large crowds, so we'll go from here. One-on-one, uh, -on -one I do okay. Um, district 65, you know, is the um, elementary district for Evanston. I'm the purchasing manager. We do our purchasing primary by state and um, board um, approval. We follow the codes and the rules that are set um, under the school codes. Construction, we bid out when it's over 50000 and for supplies, materials, and service, over 25,000. Um, contracts are always awarded based on the lowest responsible and responsive vendor. The only um, change in that is transportation. That has changed. Um, there are a lot of items that the district purchases, be it um, printing the reports, taxes, per perishable foods, some professional skills that do not have to go out for bid. Those would they'll usually do a request for proposal or meet with different vendors and then make a decision on that. Which button? This one? No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> like I said, not used to this. Um, District 65, we utilize state bids quite a bit um, for vehicle purchasing, paper, school furniture. We also use um, cooperatives and consortiums for a lot of our purchasing. As you can see from the list, and I'm trying to speed this up, so um, <laughs> for supplies, food, insurance, workman compensation, um, we purchased some sheds, again, school furniture, and uh, we are part of the Evanston recycling services that Evanston uses. Our projects are decided and approved by the board, and that is done 
um, both by the schools and by um, the administration. Um, specifications are developed. We do advertise in the Evanston and Skokie reviews, and we do put the bids on our website. All bids are publicly opened and read aloud, and bid recommendations are submitted to the board for approval. Vendors, when a bid is done, um, or when you become part of our listings, there's, um, well, let me explain that. If you win a bid, there's certain requirements you really have to have, which is a certificate of insurance, a W-9. You have to um, respond to the prevailing wage, bid bonds, performances. You have to respond to criminal code um, compliances, Drug Free Act. All these have to be complied to for when you win a bid and depending what the bid is. Now, if you want to be put on my list, and I do keep a list, you would send me a letter at the district. My address is on the, on the last form. Explain your company, give me some information, name, address, everything like that. I keep that information and add it to a database, and then I also send it to the schools or the departments that would possibly be interested in it. Like if, if you're a painter, that's gonna go to our building and grounds department. If you're doing printing, or um, posters and stuff, I'll send that to the schools because we are decentralized in our purchasing. So some things, they have their own budgets, they're gonna make their own decisions and this way they'll know that these are companies in Evanston that they can decide if they want to try and use you. This coming so spring we have our, ho our yearly housekeeping bid. Um, I do have a listing of that. Um, we are only sending bids to Illinois vendors and stuff and that's going to come out in uh, April and May and then we also have building security coming up this year. Now there will be construction bids but at this time I can't tell you that does not come through my department. Next year we have transportation and we do have coach buses coming up. If there's any coach bus companies out here that we're going to have a trip that we need to use a coach bus. Um, again, last list on the back is my address. See? Speed presentation. Any questions? <laughs> Here we go. Yes, ma'am. Um, that would be building and grounds. Um, we do use that. Um, your contract, if you come and see me, I can give you his name and number. But they do have that yearly if there's. I do have that list, but then I would forward it on to building and grounds to the, the coordinator for that. Anyone else? Everybody's getting tired. There we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Ms. Kent, thank you very much for your presentation. The last person on our list and then after this presentation, we'll open it up to questions as well as you'll have an ability or an opportunity to network. We have with us from 202, uh, the AV of Purchasing, Ms. Kimberly Kent. Oop. Henry. Thank you. Good morning. I'm sure that applause was because I'm the last one and you're ready to get to the networking <laughs> session. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm Kimberly Henry. I am the purchasing agent for District 202. Unlike District 65, we are a one building um, school district and we are a comprehensive high school sprawled over a 65 acre campus. We have approximately three buildings um, that belong to the campus. The main campus building houses about four wings, and we have a power plant, a nature center, um, classroom facility. And I say that to let you know the um, enormous campus that we do have contained under that one building. And you can imagine with a campus of that size that there would be you know, a lot of maintenance and other services that we would need to go out to, you know, to bid for. Um, ETHS has an annual operating budget in excess of $68 million. And like District 65, we have a lot of the um, 
same building require, uh, bidding requirements, being that we are a school district that adheres to the Illinois school code. So we must bid all projects that are 25,000 um, and above out. Um, and anything under that, anything that's 10,000, we would definitely need the approval of our um, board. And there are various ways that you can um, become a bidder um, for the district. Well, there's two um, in actuality. You can submit your request to, um, oh, you can, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably on like the third one. Uh, yes. <laughs> so you can submit um, to me on your company's um, letterhead your request to be placed on our bid list. And what you would do is to list whatever product or service that your company um, provides. Or you can also um, sign up under our web page, on the home page, there is a section that is called e-alerts sign up. And what that does, what that does is that it allows you to enter in information about your company um, and what you will in turn receive is an email when there are various bids um, that are placed on our website, you'll get an automatic um, email detailing that um, product or, or service that we are seeking bids for. And we're really trying to encourage vendors to use that. Uh, we do advertise in the Evanston um, Review as well. And we do have all of the, we're making an effort to get all of the construction and many of the other bids on our, on our website. But a sure way to get notification is through that e-alert um, sign up and that's a free service that you, know, you can um, enlist your business in to be notified about our projects, upcoming projects. And all winning bids you know, do require board approval and you are required to adhere to all the certifications and affidavits that the bid documents um, require, um, many of which were mentioned by um, Bonnie. And the next to the last sheet gives you a contact um, sheet of information about um, who you can contact within the organization. Our CFO is William Stafford and the director of operations is Jose Guerrero. Now he is the one who would have the um, most information about construction um, bits that are in the, in the works along with his assistant Clarence Gregory. And then that next to the last slide just gives you an idea of the summer projects that are slated for this coming year. And on there you will see that there are um, tuck pointing, replacement of pool roof, the renovation of the science labs on the third floor in our east wing, as well as the student success center, which is a remodel of an area um, within uh, space in the in the building. So those are just a few of the projects that are, are, are coming up. Now many of these projects will require the um, services of our architects that we work with. There are some projects that we do in-house and all of those will always be on the website and we are making an effort to include these um, construction CIP type of um, projects on the website as well. And so that's the short and sweet of it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your interest in Evanston Township High School and look forward to um, making contact with you. All right, folks, we're going to open this up to questions and, and and I want to thank you all for, for staying to the end. Before you ask your question, if you could just do me one favor, can you please tell us your name and, and tell us the name of your business, okay? Name and the name of your business so we know who you are. Let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Peter? Yes, sir. I wonder if I could maybe provide a clarification on something. Please. I want to make sure I didn't confuse people. Please.
not the pre-qualification process, right? This is basic information, who you are, how to get a hold of you, what you sell, we put you in the right category. So a year from now, when it's time to do a bid for office supplies, if you sell office supplies, that's when we will pull you off that list and make sure you get a copy of that IT or RFP. So I want to make sure I didn't create any confusion there by making it sound like it was all one step. The goal with preferred vendors, pre-qualified lists of printers or, or is minimizing risk. So the, the point is, the reason it's a pre-qualification process at that point, not a registration process, is because we want anybody at Northwestern to pick one of those vendors to buy from, to have the confidence that that vendor is going to be able to do a good job for them. Does that make sense? And so um, any of the eight printers on that list, no matter who you go with, you're going to get a good product, a fair price, et cetera. So that's the kind of the two steps. So I didn't want anybody to get confused by this. Just, this just gets you on our radar so we can make sure to exclude you next time around based on what you sell. So Thank you. I, I'm sorry. So no. A couple of questions came up. I thought maybe that got lost. Thank you for the clarification. Are there any other questions back here? Okay. Job order. Anybody want to take that? Anyone? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, thank you. And Sharon, can, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone's presentation will be on the City of Evanston website. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. And so if we can pull out some way the slides that have all the contact information and, and highlight that, would that be possible? Okay, good. So to the group, that's a great question. So we'll make sure everyone's presentation that you sat through this morning will be posted somewhere on our City of Evanston's website and we'll be sure to put the purchasing contact information to make sure that that's highlighted so you don't have to uh, fish through the whole presentation. Next question, right here.
have uh, we have more than one contract for food, which you know is an ideal at times. But we have we do have food service providers on campus. For example, Sodexo and Aramark. Aramark provides food service for Kellogg. Sodexo provides food service for Campus Dining, the Student Center, Athletics. And so when, when we don't, we, I know we don't contract for individual food products, but what we can do is we can be connecting to the people within Sodexo and Aramark to see if that there's an opportunity to make your product available within their location. So, you know, they have retail uh, stores on campus and they also have <coughs> restaurants. So I, we definitely have to contact people for those vendors. So we, so we, but it wouldn't be on a, we wouldn't make the decision on a product by product basis. They probably, I think they have a process that they go through to assess what they want to sell, and we would just need to hook into that process. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Now, the catering, I should say, is catering is also available through Sodexo and Aramark, but we at times have a need for outside caterers, and so, you know, again, we have to save money and minimize risk. We think it's prudent to have a pre-qualified list of catering companies to market to department schools as well. When, so we try to steer towards Aramark and Sodexo when we can, if you can't use those two, we have a portfolio of caterers that you can you can turn to as well. Thank you. Next question over here. Oh, oh, oh please. Please. I just want to echo the same thing. We also have our subcontracted for our building managers. We do have some kind of plan of need for outside caterers. Most of the time it's handled internally, but every once in a while we do go out. So you may want to reach out to us also. somebody who made a product, a food product, and you know, we're not going to contract for that product, but we were able to connect it to Sodexo, and they were able to evaluate that product, and whether it ended up being sold in the store or not, I'm not sure, but we have facilitated that connection in the past. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Right over here. What I'm going to re would recommend is that uh, we spend the, maybe the next 15 or 20 minutes and encourage you to come up and introduce yourselves to our panelists and exchange business cards. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to make sure that for all of you, please take the time to complete the surveys. Uh, we really rely on that information just to help us to improve next year's event. I also want to quickly uh, thank our city staffs for working so hard to put this together, the folks that are still here, as well as reaching out to our guests and, and, our, and our panel of experts and, and representatives from the major uh, institutions in town. It's, it, we really appreciate you being here to be a part of this conversation. So to our local businesses, I'm going to wish you all a very successful 2014. We thank you all again for your presence. And, please feel free to come up and introduce yourself to our panelists. Thank you very much.